Hello, everyone, and welcome to Salt Lake City's My Voice, My Senses, My Future Town Hall for the Black Community. We are lucky to be joined today by some talented community leaders who will help get to the heart of why we are completing this census and why it is so important. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here tonight and having this discussion. It's our hope that by talking about all of the far reaching impacts the census has that we'll be able to encourage more people to complete it. I want to be clear here at the beginning that there are no downsides for any individual for completing the census. The personal information gathered names, ages, addresses and everything else is protected and it stays with the Census Bureau. It's not shared with law enforcement or other agencies. Our panelists are going to explain more about that and how the data is used by the Census Bureau. But I think it's worth noting repeatedly because misconceptions about the census are one of the main reasons people choose not to take it. Like other cities throughout this country, people of color are underrepresented in Salt Lake City. An accurate census is vitally important part of correcting that. When African American communities are undercounted, political boundaries may not accurately represent reality. Undercounting results in being denied a full voice policy decision making. As a result, different community needs may not be represented or prioritized according to their real share of the population. One last thing I'm excited to talk about is that today we announced Rose Park Connect. It's a collaboration with Salt Lake County and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to provide access to Wi-Fi addressing that digital divide in Salt Lake City. And it also connects people with computers for people in the Rose Park area. People can use the computer lab of the Rose Park Stake Center of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is at 760 North, 1200 West. Community members can complete the 2020 census at this facility and do any other online tasks they may need. The facility will be open Monday and Wednesday from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. and Tuesday and Thursday from 7 to 9 p.m. Physical distancing will be followed and those who use the services there are asked to wear masks. With that, I'm happy to turn the time over to our wonderful moderator, Sean Newell, the director of the Utah Multicultural Civic Council. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mayor Mendenhall. This is uh, it's wonderful to spend this evening with you and uh, the rest of our distinguished guests. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us this evening. We have some uh, panelists here and uh, we have a great opportunity to share some information and to also hear from you, the community. Uh, with us this evening, we have Betty Sawyer, who is the president of the Ogden branch of the NAACP and also the executive director of Project Success. We have Jasmine Walton, who is with NeighborWorks. Uh, we have Representative Sandra Hollins with us this evening. Thank you, Representative Hollins, for taking the time to be with us. And we have Mr. James Jackson, who is the Executive Director of the Utah Black Chamber of Commerce. So what I want to do right now is have a take an opportunity to have each of these individuals introduce themselves and tell us real quickly why they're here this evening and why they feel to this discussion about the census is important. Um, Betty, I'll have you take it first. Good evening again to everyone. And I'm excited to be here to talk about the importance of the census and how relevant that is to all of us. Uh, as the mayor stated, we're often underrepresented as a community and it impacts us uh, disproportionately in so many areas. And so I'm here to lend my voice to say, yes, it's about our future, it's about the census, but it begins with the actions that we take today. So encouraging everyone, if you have not filled out the census, to do that immediately. Wonderful. Jasmine, can you give us a little insight as to a little more about you and uh, why you're here this evening? Yeah, thanks, Sean. So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jasmine Walton. I am from NeighborWorks Salt Lake. We're a community development organization that works in neighborhoods of choice and predominantly here on the west side of Salt Lake. Um, I'm excited to be here tonight because 
The census is so important. This is also my first time completing the census as a young person. So I'm excited to encourage all of my other young uh, people out there to take the census, uh, explain why it's important, how you can help your other family members take the census. So really excited to be here tonight. Wonderful, thank you very much. And Representative Hollins, I think uh, most people know who you are, as well as <laughs> but uh, please share a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Mayor Mendenhall, for your willingness to have this important conversation. Um, I'm here because I represent the west side of Salt Lake City, District 23. And historically, um, the West Side has had a low, um, sen low turnout in um, turning in their census or completing the censors. And that is impact in our community. So I'm here to encourage the West Side community to, um, to complete the census, to um, address um, those myths that's around filling out the census, and hopefully um, we'll have higher numbers this year. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. James Jackson who's with the, he's the, is the executive director of the Utah Black Chamber of Commerce. Take a moment, James, and tell us about yourself and what you do with the Chamber of Commerce and some of your interest in the census. Sure, thank you for, thank you, Sean, for the introduction. James Jackson, the third founder and executive director of the Utah Black Chamber. I am a native Utah, and I've seen the progress that Utah has made as far as increasing in diversity. And as the Black Chamber grows, grows to ensure that there are resources and education for not only Black businesses, but also for the Black professionals as they um, work to thrive here in Utah, it's important that we have all Black individuals counted to ensure that those resources are in place. Also, as people work as also people travel or relocate into Utah, I would love to try to change the narrative and the perception of what people have about Utah and that we do have a growing diversity and that we have a place that is becoming more and more welcoming for everybody. Wonderful. Thank you very much. To get this conversation started off, I wanted to get a little context interjected here. The census, if for those that don't know, only comes around every 10 years. So whatever decisions we make, being positive or negative, uh, which tonight we're going to talk about participation, impact us for the next years. Uh, right now, the federal government has almost six billion dollars allocated to Utah. Now we only receive these dollars based on the amount of participation we have by our citizens. So we're here this evening to really call out to the black community, um, and all other communities, uh, for that fact to come out and really participate. As Mayor Mendenhall mentioned, it's not a, it's not a scary place to be. There was, there was a lot of fear put in um, the media and so forth to try to stop people from participating, but um, that's, that's really not something that we should be concerned about right now. What we should be concerned about is our future for the next 10 years, what impacts we're gonna have on our community and the, fu the funding that's available to things like education, food programs, transportation, all these things that impact us as citizens of this great state. So one of the first questions I'm gonna push out to everyone is the census or the impact of the census have on the black community. I'll we'll go in reverse order this time and we'll have James answer that question for us. I'm sorry, you said reverse order and Wanted me to answer? Yeah. I just want to be yeah. sure. <laughs> I'm I'm dog, like, <laughs> I'm a dog barking in the background, so I want to be sure I understood right. Um, as I, as you just mentioned, education is a huge piece as far as the black community is concerned. You know, our focus within the black chamber and myself has always been on economic development and re having that education available to learn and grow. And as you, as we're all aware, when we talk about equity, the black community has been behind for so long just because of the systemic racism that's been um, into our system, you know, since the beginning of time. And so not being counted further prohibits us to engage further in 
um, when we don't have the access to education, especially in, in underrepresented areas uh, such as Rose Park um, and Glendale and other areas that, you know, that Representative Hollins really um, leads on. And so it's important that we have those resources in place, that we do provide uh, those numbers, get that the funding available so we can increase the resources available for education. That's the biggest component um, for me when I think about economic development, providing resources for businesses to, to grow, um, have more access to grants. It all starts with education. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, James, for that. Um, Representative Hollins. Yes, and, and I would agree with a lot what, what um, James Jackson said. It's because this is going to impact what is important to us as a black community. This impacts Pell Grants. It impacts um, housing. It impacts um, almost every aspect of education. Um, and so this is this is what is important to us, um, even down to our representation in the political arena. The census impact that. So it's important to the black community because it impacts everything that is important to us. Wonderful. Wonderful. And Jasmine, you're also um, in the west part of our, our, our I should say our community. Um, what are you seeing as some of the impacts that might greatly affect the black community? Yeah, so definitely I think I mimic what both James and Representative Holland said. Um, especially here on the West Side, we're seeing, you know, a lack of resources when it comes to schooling, right, with our school age kids. Uh, like the lunch programs will be impacted, right? The census dollars really do travel really far for our community here on the West Side, um, especially because a lot of uh, black people in their community are renters, right? And so we're seeing that the housing market's being affected. We're seeing that lack of representation, like uh, Representative Holland said. So completing the census is very important. We want to be able to provide more resources, more allocation, more representation. Wonderful, wonderful. And Betty, you, you, you're close, especially in the Ogden area, with a lot of youth and your work you do with youth. Um, can you Give us a little insight as to the impact uh, the census has on some of the programs that are there to take care of our young people. Yes, uh, Project Success Coalition itself is a nonprofit that has been in existence for 31 years. And we focused on education, health, and cultural arts. And all of those areas are directly impacted by the census and the dollars that come along with our representation. As you know, uh, generally a little less than $2,000 per person is what that economic impact of filling out the census. So if we are not filling that out, we can clearly see that as we do that across a whole community of people, that economic impact can be devastating. It'd be a great loss. So uh, it's already been mentioned, even in terms of housing, uh, we've all been experiencing uh, the need for a decent and affordable housing. And so the decisions that are made today are the ones that are gonna impact us for the next 10 years. So that's why this is critically important in the midst of pandemic and economic downturns to get a strong and full count of everybody because we will pay the price Ultimately, I think about healthcare, the work that we do in healthcare, Midtown Community Health Center services the majority of low income people in Ogden, East Central Ogden and West Ogden. Without federal dollars, they wouldn't be able to continue the work that they do on the level that is needed. Uh, I work in higher ed as well. And it was mentioned earlier about Pell Grants are uh, determined the amount of Pell Grants that come to the state ties directly in with the census. So not only are we encouraging uh, older adults and, and heads of household to fill it out, but if you are a college student, a young adult that are living uh, in your household, make sure that you get that census filled out because it does impact you directly. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I wanted to add real quick, a little context to some of the um, points that the panelists have brought up. 
and I'll follow right on with Betty right now um, because those, those are fresh in my mind. <laughs> the student loans, um, based on the allocation we have for the state of Utah right now, there's almost nine hundred and two million dollars allocated to students loan to student loans, and that gets chipped away at if we don't have participation. You know, she mentioned housing also. There's about seventy five million in housing um, benefits for Section Eight that we would not receive if people do not fill out their census forms. When we talk about our children, our most precious asset, the the impact there is great on children's programs. Child care, almost sixty million dollars allocated to child care, one hundred and twenty eight million to the health care for children um, allocated to our state, ninety nine million for the school lunch program and 89 million for the Title I grants for our schools. So you can start to see where it's important that we participate um, as citizens in the census, because these impacts are just, I mean, it, it can really uh, be detrimental to us if we don't participate. So why are, you know, why is the black community often missed so often in, in the census? And then we'll, we'll go back down in order again, and we'll have Miss Betty uh, give us some insight here. One of the uh, historical factors has been the fact of mistrust in government. Anytime someone from the government comes, we are looking uh, both ways to see if there's an ulterior motive here. So if we're not doing the proper education up front, people have a tendency to say, oh, here they go again. They want something from us. They're trying to get our information. And that's not totally the case. The census itself only takes about 10 minutes. I filled mine out in about five minutes uh, for the household. So, so it's a small action that we could take that will impact us, like I said, for the next 10 years. But a part of the work that we do is help one, dispel the myths about the census, knowing that even the census workers themselves have to uh, declare an oath of not disclosing any of this information. So no one gets access to that information, but the ones that actually need it. So again, uh, dispelling those myths, encouraging us to take it. And, and we're in a mobile community too. And when I say mobile, uh, because a lot of us are renters, our address changes, we move from place to place. And so through that mobility, if something was mailed, you might've missed it. And so that second wave of the census initiative when enumerators come door to door uh, helps fill that gap that was missing during those kinds of transitions. But the good thing, if you don't want anybody coming to your door right now, then <laughs> fill it out online, go over to Rose Park Connect and, and get it done in less than, you know, 10 minutes. Great. You know, one of the things when we talk about trust is how the system that exists in place tries to deter us from receiving all of these dollars. It was just Monday, this past Monday, that the Census Bureau announced that they were going to move the the final day closing date for the census by 30 days from September 30th, or from October the 31st to September 30th. Now, this puts some pressure on us as a community to get out there and make sure that we're filling out our census forms. One of you speak to the um, to the way that we can ask for urgency within the black community so that people understand that this is this is critical crunch time for us to get out there. And as uh, Miss Betty alluded to, we have an opportunity to do this without people knocking at our doors. So um, how do we create that urgency without folks worrying about come, people coming to your door and asking you to fill out the sentence in person? One of those challenges for me would be, you know, old school, each one reach one. And that would be our call to action tonight. Everybody go out there and help one other person to fill out the census. Everybody call, text, write, snap, uh, whatever way you communicate with your friends. Uh, you better hurry up and use TikTok or that may be gone. So <laughs> but whatever way you communicate with, with your friends and family, that's what we're asking you to do today, not tomorrow but right now today and 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 put a post with you calling someone or helping someone fill out that census 
And and I oh go ahead, Jasmine. Oh, and to just mimic what uh, Miss Betty said is you know for young people right like me, you're talking to your family members all of the time. You know, have that conversation within your household. Are you taking the census? Why it's important? You know, help your grandma, your aunt, whoever take the census. It's really easy to complete. You can do it like she was saying in five minutes, right? So just go out and do it. And I want to add to that, you know, um, I think we need to emphasize that we all pay taxes and we all pay, we all pay federal, the federal government. Do you not want that money to come back to you? Because essentially this is what it is. It is your money that you didn't pay it out coming back to the community in which you live to help educate and take care, uh, educate your kids and to do for your community and to make sure that you have um, that make sure you have um, um, good roads to drive on. Make sure that the transportation system fits your needs. Make sure that you're being taken care of healthcare wise. And so this is money that you've paid out. And I know for me, I, I love bringing home a dollar. <laughs> you know, my dollar that I have honestly earned. And I think the federal government um, shouldn't keep that money, that it should be back in my community doing good, which is what I would prefer my tax dollars to go. Yeah, I was just going to mention that what, was sent, what Representative Hollins mentioned is that this is money that we've already put in as far as taxes. And, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. And this is what I think about is like all of us are coming together. So we're depending on each other to fill out the census because we want all of us to be counted. And if we if one of us doesn't fill out the census, that's eighteen hundred dollars that's out of the door that could have helped our community. And so it's not only or your responsibility um, for your own family, but you're taking responsibility for other families around you as well. We all need to start coming together and and unify to ensure that we, you know, just like Betty was mentioning, calling up one by one and being sure that we're um, filling out the census. Share just how e share how easy it is um, to fill out the census. Walk people who are not familiar with the internet. Walk them through the process. I mean, it took me a household of five. It took less than five minutes to fill out the census. It was, it was real easy. Made it real quick. And we have facilities like Rose Park Connect. Um, so if you don't have access to the internet, you can just go over there and fill it out. Um, and there's plenty of people out there, um, other resources out there that we can just go online to uh, 2020 census.gov and fill out the census. So um, we wanted to provide every access so there's absolutely no excuse uh, for our community to fill out the census. So we just need to be sure that we communicate that um, and the opportunity that exists when we do fill out the census. Wonderful. You know, we, we touched on the, the some of the monetary impacts, um, but what other consequences are there for the black community if we do not do this? Um, and if we do not stretch ourselves to get out and fill out these census forms, um, it's been mentioned that it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, so if we're going to avoid spending five or 10 minutes filling this out, there are some issues that come up that are going to significantly harm our community. Can any of you speak to those um, and those impacts again, a little bit deeper as to, um, you know, how and and what some things that you know maybe none of us even think about uh, being impacted. One of the things, if I may, when we were talking about uh, representation uh, on a district and, and national level, and currently uh, we have legislation before us about redistricting. So other people are trying to draw lines to define how our communities will be represented and who will represent that community. So when we don't fill out the census and give a full count, it makes it easier for some of those funny looking lines to be drawn and without us speaking up and having a say in what that representation looks like. Uh, one of the other critical things by not filling it out, again, as a local nonprofit, I depend upon government funding to do the Juneteenth Festival to do community Kwanzaa celebration, to do after school programs, to do our uh, outreach in health and wellness and diabetes awareness and those 
kinds of things. So I'm one of a few African-American organizations that is doing this work. And so when you don't fill out the census, that impacts me directly and what I'm able to do, not only in the Ogden community, but a lot of the work that, uh, that we do with Project Success is statewide. So we immediately see the impact of uh, those programs, that representation. Uh, Sandra Hollins, Representative Hollins, is a lone force, uh, a lone black voice in the state legislature. Why does it have to be just one person? We don't have any uh, Congress persons that are black or people of color. Why is that the case? So again, being able to impact getting additional seats in Congress is something that ties directly to us filling out or not filling out our census. And, and can I, oh, and I was, I was gonna say, can I bring that back specifically to the West Side community? Um, and some statistics. We talked about education and Title I schools. Currently on the West Side, I have 12 Title I schools just in my district. That's 12 Title I schools. I have 17% of the population on this side of town receiving public assistance. And I have 22% of the population between the age of five and 17, which means they're, they're school age kids. The census can have a real impact on, on them. We're talking about, we're right now in, um, uh, uh, um, talking about COVID-19. And I have a lot of individuals in my area with food insecurities. We need to fill out the census because that is going to impact all of that. It impacts the, the services that your kids are receiving in schools. It impacts their lunch and their food program. It, 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 it impacts the quality of education that they're getting. And so as we're talking about all of this on the West side, let's remember that that all of us want quality education. I think that's one thing we all have in common, regardless of your race or culture or economic income. We want quality education. And if you want quality education for your kids, this is something very, very simple that you can do that takes less than five minutes. That's a very small investment to get to that, isn't it? You know, you mentioned the situation we're in right now with COVID. And I think about the health disparities for the black community. Uh, the census actually accounts for $1 million for Medicare. So those that are most impacted based on the stats that we're seeing um, in the black community as far as age and um, health disparities are impacted greatly. We could use those funds. There are $35 million in healthcare centers. Without those funds, we don't have those health care centers to be able to service our communities. So it's really critical that we think about all these, you know, impacts that people don't really realize when that this, this um, uh, touches. And I think it's important that, you know, we continue in our community over the next um, month and a half, two months we have, I believe, to really illustrate and illuminate these things to our community. So how how was the you know Miss Betty mentioned it you know people uh, you know, reach and touching one another interpersonally, but how can we how can we really emphasize the fact that you know there's so much information out there about the census, but as a community we're not seeing it, and there's a few folks out there that like myself that have tried to share it and we get very little response. Um, any of you think of any ideas of how we can improve that so that we can get people to feel safe and realize the this small investment will make a world of difference for our community if they just felt the right form? One of the things that I that I um, being born and raised here in Utah, one of our strengths is how well we can work together. Um, this recently um, a lot of the black organizations within Utah, I think almost about a dozen of us came together and put um, a Utah Black Voters Matter campaign. Just all of us coming together, sharing strategies on how we can get out the initiative and vote. 
um, and working on that strategy. And I think it's the same thing we should we will be doing with the census is we have, you know, a, over a dozen and counting black organizations within Utah, and we all understand the importance of the census. And we're constantly communicating um, with our community. Um, and, and we and even though there's overlap and there's no such thing when it comes to the census, there's no such thing as over communicating, um, you know, Betty's with project success and then I'll come in with the black chamber representative Hans and you know with her sorority and all the other organizations she's a part of then Jasmine Walton comes in who continue this uh, constant communication about the census um, you, using all the organizations that we are affiliated with or know of um, and getting that message out I think will be powerful wonderful yeah. wonderful you know I, I want to interject you real quick for those that are um, how do I fill out my census? It's real simple. You can go online to my2020census.gov and fill out the form right there. And again, it's very simple. Um, there's only, I believe, what, 10 questions. Um, I did it the first week it was out there. But again, um, there's some urgency here because of the date being moved up. And we need to get people to fill out the census. So again, it's my2020census.gov. Um, does anyone want to talk about how the our our, our faith community can help? Um, I know that the faith communities are really strong um, among the black population, and I know that people hear about the census a little bit at church. But how can people correlate their faith along with their responsibility to have to fill out the census? anything to add to that? I would say that the, the faith community is critical in, in this effort. And as James was sharing about pulling together the coalition to vote, that same type of effort has to be done for this. Um, the Utah Black Roundtable, a part of our census effort and following the NAACP model, you know, we could push out uh, Census Sunday, or if you uh, get together on Friday for, for your religious and spiritual encounters. It could be Census Friday or Census Thursday, whatever day of the week that is. Uh, we can do targeted efforts over the next uh, few weeks around Census seniors, you know, making sure our senior population uh, is uh, filling out the census. And the same thing for our college students. And I know at Weaver and probably every institution has put together a push to get those college students to do it. But I think by uh, directly reaching out to our faith community, giving them the script and the information and just asking them, because many of them are doing virtual services right now. So it'd be easy to put a plug and for us to send, you know, an image where they can go or a bar uh, scan to go on that site immediately and give their congregation, you know, that five minute break to fill out the census. Uh, you had mentioned with the sororities, we have several sororities and fraternities in the state. And again, it could be that uh, sorority day or fraternity day where we make sure that we are making that extra push. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, there was a question that came in over Facebook about um, what type of outreach is being done to ensure that new Americans are being counted. And again, that points to the, the fear that people have of the census form itself. And I'll answer that a little bit, but then I want my panel to take a, a stab at it as well. Um, one of the things that we had to examine in the, in the black community is that we have a very large African community. And a lot of times they have some communication barriers or fear barriers as well um, in being counted um, in the census. Does anybody here on the panel have any insights as to how we might reach some of those folks a lot more readily? So I think just to give my two cents here, right? I think a way to start reaching out to those communities is just like we in the black community have all of our various organizations, the new American community also has their um, organizations as well. And it's coming together, like we've been saying, 
and connecting and saying, hey, what, how can we strategically push this out to both of our communities and make this a larger effort than just say, putting that on one or two individual organizations to really do the effort, right? So it's just connecting um, and finding out who those players in those communities are and getting them to come to the table. Yes, and, and I agree with, um, with what Jasmine just said. You know, um, we, um, who I guess I'll call old Americans, <laughs> um, um, we have, we're skeptical about the government. And so we have these individuals who are new Americans who have over the last four years listened to all of this rhetoric and, and have been frightened about what is being said about them and, and what it will mean if they fill out this paperwork. Um, and I think part of that is reaching out to the community leaders. I think you first have to gain the trust of the community leaders um, and then go from there um, and talk to them um, about the importance of, of filling out this information and try to reassure them that this is that um, that this is not going to impact their citizenship, that they are American citizens, but we need to have um, have this count of you so that we are able to better support you um, in our communities. That's great. Well, another issue that has come up, especially since COVID has taken over, is access to both computers and the internet. Prior to the COVID situation we were in, there was a, a, a big effort in allowing, having libraries um, advertise that they're available to uh, people come in and fill out their census forms. Um, other public places would allow people to come in and, and fill out their census forms. How do we mitigate the fact that we can't do that now? Um, I know Mayor mentioned some new hotspots um, and new computers, but we have a very short window here and you know, people that are just getting this technology are going to have a learning curve to just figure out how to get things working right off the bat. Um, so maybe some members in the community can um, can benefit from us kind of giving them some insights as to how to mitigate that and how to uh, take advantage of opportunities that they have right in their hand, literally speaking, um, with their with their phones and not being fearful of using those devices to uh, actually fill out their forms. Anybody else have any insight there? I would say, uh, first of all, again, making sure people know that we have a couple of places on the west side of Salt Lake at uh, the Rose Park Connect and the Sorensen Center where they can go and get assistance and use devices and have internet to fill that out. One of the other things that we may be able to look at over the next few weeks, uh, in Ogden, we have our farmer's market and uh, we have voter registration that, that we're involved in there. So maybe we could take our laptops and be ready to support people filling out the census in those places. If we're having any other special events, uh, we've had a number of rallies and for me, anytime I raise an issue, I want to be there to help build a solution. And so while we're out and about in those uh, those spaces to make sure that we are prepared and use that opportunity to promote the census and assist people at that time, uh, we're, we're doing um, our Juneteenth in September. We did it in June, but we're gonna be doing an event at the Ogden Amphitheater on September the 19th. And we'll definitely focus on census as well as the vote because uh, we know we just lost uh, Representative Congressman John Lewis recently. And one of the, the major platforms that he had his entire life was that about the vote and talking about how precious the vote is and even sacred. And I think the vote and the census go hand in hand. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else have any insights? Okay, wonderful. I'm, I'm getting everybody being shy now. Um. <laughs> Sean, I'd just like to add a fun thing about the census. Great. We're talking about these really deep impacts at the census, but I've been a part of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical 
uh, association. So just recently, the other night, I'm doing some of my uh, family history and that's the major documents that I was able to pull up. The 1890 census and 1840 census and actually seeing the names of my ancestors, aunts and uncles and great grandparents written down in those documents and said, you know, they could read, they could write, you know, they own a farm, all of those things. So I got excited just knowing that this record, while it supports all of these economic and educational uh, issues for us now, it also provides that record for us to go back and tell our story and connect with our roots. Oh, that's beautiful. Maybe I should have done that. <laughs> I think that reminds me. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I was just I was going to say, you know, Benny makes a good point um, to how to reemphasize the importance of filling out the census. Think about the last 10 years and how the community has benefited, or even the last 20 years, think of how the, our community has benefited from um, being counted. And representation during those last times were pretty low. We want to increase that even more this year. So think about how this decision of not filling out the census is going to impact you and your community for the next 10 years. That's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about a whole decade of, of decision here. And so that's why it's so important now to make a quick five minute decision by going to my2020census.gov, going to the Source and Tech Center or to the Rose Park Con uh, Connect and take your time and fill out that census because this decision is a 10 year decision. Yes, yes, indeed. Representative Hollins touched on something I think is really important for people to understand about the census and with infrastructure, you know, our transportation, you know, there's a lot of people in our community that don't own automobiles that have to count on public transportation to get them places. Uh, we have to count on those of us that have cars and, and drive, have to count on roads, we have to count on bridges. These are things that really impact our livelihoods. If we cannot travel and we cannot move um, society society we live in today um, we're going to be hampered as far as our mechanisms for survival so can anybody else touch on um, any impacts they see especially for the black community uh, when it comes to infrastructure and, and facilities um, aside from health which we kind of touched on but uh, these are critical things to consider and these are things that people don't consider um, when we're looking at the census, but that really have a huge impact on our community. And let me bring another piece into that as we're talking about transportation. Um, one of the big push that we have in this state is clean air. And the way to have clean air is to use public transportation and to have an adequate um, bus system that's in each community, which will cut down on us riding our, um, driving our cars, which will have a big impact on, on the air quality um, in this state. Um, my community, I'm on the west side, um, I know we have been impacted by, by poor air quality. Um, and we have new infrastructures that is going up that we're worried that what's going to be the environmental impact on us. And I know I have a large number of um, individuals in my community with asthma, um, which has a great impact. So another reason, an, another reason to fill out the census is so that we can look at getting better transportation, which is going to help improve air quality over in this district. That's great points. Along with that, I would add, as we talk about infrastructure and building roads and highways and bridges to make all of those things safer, to increase access, uh, all of those are tied to employment and jobs as well. So when, when those funds, it's not just looking at the dollars that are spent on those things, but the fact that you're developing an infrastructure for people to have longer term employment and, and employment that pays above minimum wages and things of that nature as well. Wonderful. You know, I, as we we're, were talking about um, parts of the census that most people don't think of, I wanted to direct something to um, James. You know, we look at the census and there's currently about $19 million allocated to hub zones. 
So we talk about entrepreneurship, which a lot of times in historically, um, black communities have had entrepreneurs, but we're unable to get funding. Um, James, can you give me a little insight as to how that would impact, um, you know, entities like the black chamber or entrepreneurs overall by having or utilizing some of these hub zone funds? We well, experienced that over the last couple of months with COVID, right? When um, we saw the disparity as far as access to the PPP loans, we, you know, access to having a banking relationship, access to um, those funds. Um, and, and, and so when there's other opportunities like grants that do come up, you know, they're quickly gone. And we saw that happen with, um, there's only so many resources that the state is given um, providing those grants to build small businesses. The Black Chamber gets contacted all the time um, about businesses looking for grants. And um, for a lot, you know, since the recession, when the recession happened, there were several years we, we told them there were there are no grants available. Um, so we have to we worked hard to educate them um, and and teach them how to apply for apply for loans. And a lot of Black businesses are bootstrapping away and you know not really applying for loans they're just always cash especially when you talk about the um, the new americans where you know a lot, a lot a lot of their different cultures there don't do loans and so you know and when the ppp loan came out where they were really torn because it a grant was put in a loan and so you know culturally it wasn't acceptable for them to fill out a loan application even though it was a grant specify for certain types of uh, expenses to use during during a business. So when we look at the, the hub zone grants become available and other grants that could possibly become available based upon um, the numbers within we have within the black community, we can start seeing more grants start coming through and, and the chamber can continue educating and make them aware of those type of resources as available. We want to continue to be that hub for the black businesses. And we spent almost 11 years now developing in relationships with um, the small business development centers and the city city and county economic development departments and um, the libraries and all these other different resources that are available but in, um, in order to provide the the specific capital um, we have to we have to do more than just the loans we have to find these small grant opportunities um, where even the chamber looks is looking at like a revolving loan fund or a grant capital program that we just put out for black women owned businesses. Um, but, you know, government is important because those resources come from the community themselves and it only can, and those funds only go so far. Great. Thank you. Anyone else want to interject on that? Um, can I ask a quick question or, or, you know, kind of fire things up a little bit. We talk about the enumerators going out into our communities with the situation we're in right now these enumerators are going to be wearing masks they're going to be um most of them will probably have on street clothes and other than their their government badge to identify themselves um some of our community members may be fearful of fraud or or people in person these enumerators um it's important that you understand that as a community that they will have ID badges on them. Anybody that comes to your door, I would suggest that you demand to see their ID badge, your federal government ID badge, um, prior to you know allowing those people. You don't even really have to allow them in your house. You can so on the porch, uh, since we won't be in winter time. <laughs> but to make sure that you're safe, and and that's something that we want to um, emphasize, um, because as you well know, there are people that take advantage of of times like these. Um, to take advantage of people, especially some of our older community members. So I just wanted to throw that in there to think about the safety factor um, when these enumerators come around. Uh, and one thing to add to that, Sean, um, remember, like, they're not going to ask you for your, like, bank account information. And if no. they start asking you for that type of personal information, then they're probably not legitimate people. Excellent. Excellent. And along with that, Oh, go ahead, Miss Betty. Along with that, Sean, I think they'll be coming out as soon as next week. I, I think yes. somewhere I read the 11th. So uh, it's another opportunity for us to share with our community, be on the lookout for them, or even better yet, 
<laughs> tonight fill out your your census, then you won't have to worry about them stopping at at your door. But but they're on their way. They're coming. And again, it, it is critically important that we get counted. Even in Utah, we're always undercounted. I know we look at the demographics and, and you look at one report, they'll say we're 1%. The next report, they'll say we're 2% or you know 20,000 or 30,000. And a way for us again, and James uses that information when you're trying to get people to invest in what you're doing, they want to know what the impact is. If I invest this number of dollars, how far is that reach? And if our numbers don't reflect a significant reach, they may not be willing to invest in the work that we're doing. And so we need to have a great count for ourselves as well as for these systems of government that are impacted by this information. Thank you, well said. I want to um, tap Jasmine on the shoulder a little bit. And you mentioned it earlier about how to or the importance of reaching young people. I, I, I want some instances that how, I mean, I like to think I'm hip and I like to think I'm cool and I'm keeping up, but um, I'm way off. I'm just, that's, those are just my, my actions. So <laughs> um, if you can give us some insight as to how we might be able to get the younger generations um, understanding the importance of filling out the um, census and, and understand how they can do that because a lot of the young people understand that if they're in college and they're not living in their household, um, the parents aren't going to count them and they're not really, is that right? They're not supposed to count them. They're supposed to count themselves or the, or the parents can't count them, right? Which way is it? So I believe it's that you, your parents don't count you yeah. because you're not living in the household, but there are a lot of, especially here in Utah, there are a lot of college students that commute to and from school. So if you're still living at home with mom and dad, mom and dad should count you um, if you live there by April 1st. But if you have moved out uh, prior to or after April 1st, then you should count yourself and do your own household. And that means even if you're living with roommates, you count them as well on your, uh, on your census. Uh, to bring it back to what you said about how you get them to uh, understand the importance and get that information out to them. I think it is a lot of the social media, right? A lot of people my age in their early 20s and are constantly on their Facebook, on Instagram, on right now, TikTok probably still have it, right? Um, and so I think it's just pushing that um, out there, having people that they can relate to, right? That look like them talking about why this is important, how this impacts them with their Pell Grants, if you're a recipient of that. Um, so it's really just getting down to their level, I think, and getting them fired up about how this is gonna impact them over the next 10 years. Great, great. And hopefully they're, if you're living with a, a couple of roommates, you're talking roommates, hey, we need to do this, and you know, yeah. making sure everybody's participating. Yeah, everybody go to brunch and pull your phone out and uh, complete the census. And, and can I just add a little anecdote to that? So a lot of young people, you may be 18 and 19 years old now, but in 10 years, you're going to be 29 and you're going to be, this is going to be impacting you differently than it's impacting you now. So just, yeah. just think about that. Yeah, I was just going to say that you got to think about your future, you know, 18, 19, you can be, you know, we live in Utah. So 28, 29, you can be married with a few, with a few children. And so that, that little extra dollars will come in handy. <laughs> you know, another point that when we talk about young people that I wanted to get across is our most undercounted demographic are children five and under. And I've yet to understand why that was the case. I attended an event in Galveston with all of the um, people from the black community, um, students of census, and that was a demographic that, or a, a population that I had no idea that people wouldn't count their children under five. For some reason, they assumed that they're not already in school, that it didn't count against the census. So. I implore everybody out there to treat young children as well, um, because that's important for us to be able to get the dollars that we're looking for. 
Utah has a very young population. And so it's definitely uh, important that we make sure people know counting everyone that's in that household. That's agreed. So as, as leaders, um, and that you are because you're here today, I'm just gonna give you that title. <laughs> um, how is it that, that you navigate this space when people approach you about the census, when they approach you with your fear, their fears, they approach you with their um, their angst about, you know, letting the government know, you know, who they are, where they are, and how many people live in their house. How do we mitigate some of those fears um, when some of the people that um, count on us or or come to us for advice? Um, how do how do we tell them, you know, this is important without, you know pointing the finger at them and pushing them and dragging them and, you know, putting a pin in their hand. You know, I, I try to understand where they're coming from and I don't try to um, um, belittle their fears, but I also inform them the government already knows who you are. They know where you are. <laughs> they already have that information uh, on you. If you have a cell phone, people know where you are. <laughs> because it's binging off the of towels every time you move around this state. And so, um, and so filling out this one form is not going to make really make that that big a difference. But I let them know I do understand your your fears, but I also but the government already probably know where the, where you are. Thank you, Representative Hollis. <laughs> I just didn't want to say that. So <laughs> Anybody I'm else want to ask? I'm, I'm always willing to say what everybody else is thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that was definitely what I was thinking. <laughs> and, and if you have social media, you know your information is out there. I, I looked up my name the other day and all kind of stuff started popping up videos I was a part of, you know, 20 years ago. It's like, wait a minute, this is just too much information. So, so like Sandra, you know, tell them, yeah, I recognize your and they're valid. However, this is an opportunity for us to get a return for a change on that information versus just having it out there for free by filling out the census. At least you get something back that some of those dollars that were already yours, some of those tax dollars that you've already put into the system, you get some of that back that can help you and your family and your community. You know, before we get out of here tonight, I just wanted to remind everybody how to fill out their census. Um, you can go to my2020census.gov or you can do it by telephone. Um, if you're telephoning in by English, you know, in English, um, dial 844-330-2020, or for a Spanish version, dial 844-468-2020. Again, the English version by phone is 844-330-2020, and for a Spanish version, it's 844-468-2020. And hopefully that's helpful and we can get more people to um, get on there and get this completed. It's really important to our community as we've discussed today. Any last parting thoughts from our panelists, um, considerations that um, you may want people to take in and um, understand or, or get over um, so to make sure that we can improve this process? I remember when I was in school, um, back in like elementary school, there were, you know, there were there was a team captains and they were picking who was going to be on their team and um, you were just excited and just waited to be chosen and I admit you know when they were, when they were choosing for basketball I was a frail little guy and so I was either the last one to be chosen or I wasn't one chosen at all and I had to watch from the sidelines. If you don't put in your senses, you're going to be watching from the sidelines and looking at all the other uh, cities and counties and states um, take advantage of the opportunities while you sit on the sidelines because you didn't fill out the census and lose out on being able to play in that game. And so that's what I think about when you don't play in the census. So don't, don't, don't voluntarily sit on the sideline. This is your opportunity to go in, um, fill out that five minute application. And so you can be in the same game as everybody else is. 
And I think to add to that, right, right now there's so much conversation around change and wanting to see that change happen now. And I think the census is the first step to seeing those changes happen in real time. So go online and complete your census. And along with that, as Jasmine said, this is our opportunity to be the change that we want to see. And it starts right now. It starts with doing these simple but important acts of democracy. And, and we get to do that, filling out the census, and we get to vote. And so be the change that we want to see. It's great to protest. But after the protesting is over, then we have to put our faith in action. We have to put our commitment in action. And this is one of the ways that we can do that by going to my2020census.gov and filling out the census. And I would like to add to that. Um, I have always have people asking me, how can we support you? Tell us what you need. And that's people in my district and also people in the black community. I would like to tell them, if you want to support me, two things. Number one, vote. Please vote. Number two, fill out the census. Those are our civic duties, that, that, um, two of the most important civic duties that can help me. Do those two things, and with the census, let's bring that money back into our community to improve, um, to improve it. Wonderful. I want to thank all of our panelists tonight. Um, I want to thank our um, LaShonda, who is our ASL uh, assistant here this evening. And I want to thank the entire team um, behind the scenes that helped us to bring this to our community. And I hope that you gathered a lot from this, from hearing from the leaders in our community, and also being able to share via some of your comments here on Facebook Live. And um, I hope that you get out there tonight. Don't wait and fill out your 2020 census. Thank you very much and have a great evening.